Come with me this morning to a small house, probably in the heart of the city of Jerusalem. It's Resurrection Sunday night. And imagine yourself huddled together with the disciples. They're all there. They're, I'm sure, praying, and uh, they're trying to make sense over the last few days. Resurrection Sunday night. They know that Jesus, they were there when he was arrested. They heard about the fact that he was tortured, he was falsely accused, then he was sentenced to death. They heard that he was crucified on a cross. Only John was there with Jesus. They heard about all these things, and then they heard, they heard that Jesus may be alive. The tomb was empty. And so they were all there in this place together. And I just want to ask you, what do you think they were feeling? Let, let me just hear from you. If you were there with the disciples that night, what would you have been feeling? Anybody? Huge grief. Huge grief. I, I mean, can you possibly imagine what it would have been like to, to know that the one that you banked everything on was gone. And, and, and the sorrow, I mean, the, the loss of a dream, Jesus, everything. Yes, huge grief. What else? Anger. I'm sorry. Anger. 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 Oh, yes. For who did this to our Lord? Confusion. confusion. Yes. What kind of confusion, Patty? Amen. Amen. You put everything. You, you drop the nets. You start following Jesus. And now, after you've followed him and you've heard, he has to be the one. And now he's gone. What do I do now? Sure. Anything else? Fear. Fear. Oh, my goodness. I, th I think that may be one of the big ones. Fear over what, Marlon? Ooh, so true. Amy, I think I saw your hand as well. Over here? Oh, yes. They were terrified. That's, I mean, it could be us next. Lost, this, this horrible sense. Yes, yes. With Jesus gone, with the very fact that you based your identity not just as fishermen anymore, but as a follower of the one you were sure was the Messiah. Now who am I? That is so true. I started thinking about what it must be like to be with the disciples. And the confusion had to be there. The very fact that the women had seen and actually talked with Jesus, was this real? Was he alive? Was he dead? Where was he? And then they hear from a couple on the road to Emmaus that they had met him, they had heard him, they had actually eaten with him. What do you do with that? And then I was thinking the shame, the actual guilt that I could have been there to actually be there to support the Lord, but when it really came down to it, I wasn't there when Jesus may have needed me the most, I could have stood up and I could have said, when all the crowd was saying, crucify him, I could have said something, no, don't, you don't know who he is. Or I could have been the one to help carry his cross. Why did they ever have to appeal to a complete stranger? I could have at least helped the Lord there, but where was I? I was gone. Have you ever been there? When you knew you should have done something, you could have stood up for Christ, you could have done the right thing, you could have stepped up, and you just didn't. I was thinking about the disciples, all the healings they did in the name of Jesus, all the preaching, all the sermons they had given in his name, but all of that couldn't wipe out the agony of letting your Messiah down. And as you know, at some point in our own lives, we have let down the Messiah. We could have said something. We told people we would pray for them, but then we kind of forget. We've let ourselves down. 
We've let others we trust, we've let our family down at some point, and Lord knows we have failed our God. And just like that, just like the disciples, we can beat ourselves up. I should have, I could have, but I didn't. More than anything, as Marlon had mentioned, I, I'm sure there had to be fear in the room. John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 19, says that the doors were shut where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews. So yes, you've got it right, Marlon. By now the temple priests who conspired to kill Jesus knew the tomb was empty. Matthew's Gospel tells us that as they paid off the soldiers at the tomb, they paid them off to lie that the disciples had taken the body the only way that lie could stand up is if the disciples who knew the truth were killed as well. So, sure, they were hiding. They were huddled together. Their lives were in danger. And to be honest, I think they were really, really, really scared. Where could they go? Where could they hide? Somebody was bound to recognize them. Fear was in that room that night. And fear is sometimes with us as well. I read this week that fear is the oldest and strongest emotion in humanity. And it began at the very beginning, the first humans. <laughs> the moment they rebelled against what God told them to do, what do they do? They hide in fear. And it's been going on ever since. Where there is sin, there is fear. Fear makes us think things say things, and do things that we otherwise wouldn't do. And no one is immune to fear. Humorist Dave Barry says that all of us are born with a set of instinctive fears. We're afraid of falling. We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of lobsters, of falling on lobsters in the dark. <laughs> We're afraid of speaking before the Rotary Club or any group of people, and we're afraid of the words some assembly required. <laughs> Dads know that one especially. All of us are afraid at one point or another, and have you noticed that some of our fears may be generated not by reality, but by our perceptions of reality? Much of what we fear may not be real. Have you ever seen this acrostic for fear? false evidence appearing real. And we let our imaginations go. I churn sometimes at night over things that may happen. Have you been there? And so the way to appeal for help is I turn to the Lord and I begin in my mind to meditate on the truths and the promises of Jesus. That's why we meditate. That's why we know this word. And we embed it not only in our minds but in our hearts because we appeal to this word. There may come a time when you can't see. There may come a time when you are so weary that you just can't even think. But guess what? The word of God that's embedded in your heart is, is just comes to the surface and you remember once again, child, I will never leave you or forsake you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Those words embedded in our heart, they, they come to the surface. Jesus told his disciples, I will die, but I will rise again. He told them, and yet it just didn't quite sink in. Even then, all they could do on Resurrection Sunday night was hide in fear. And any moment, the temple guards could barge into the room, could tear down the walls, and they could come and come after them, and it would be over. That night, yes, they were visited, but not by temple guards. They were visited by the risen Messiah. John chapter 20, verse 19, describes this amazing encounter and and it's on that little bulletin handout that I gave you. It goes like this. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, when the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I think I would be pretty excited. Just, just look at what Jesus says when he, he comes into the room. I'm not sure if he floated in, if he walked in. The door was there shut. He just shows up. And what does he say? Ta-da! No, he doesn't do that. He says, peace be with you. And just like that, in his midst, Jesus transformed their confusion into calm. Jesus could have said, where were you? Where were you guys? I trained you up. You were with me. We ate together. I, I poured my life into you. Where were you? But he didn't say that. How often when somebody has let us down, we bear that grudge and we just let them know what they said or what they did really hurt us. And I, I want to say that there is a place for that honesty. We need to be able to approach each other. And I pray with graced words, say, you know what? That, that just didn't come across right. We need to be honest. But here's where we need to really ask our Lord for help. Those grudges, those seeds of a little bit of resentment, that needs to go. Because even though we don't say anything, it'll show up. That, that grudge can still be there. And we need to constantly ask God, is there something in me that, that's still simmering? We may not come out and say it, but it's written all over our face. We know it. They know it. And often everybody else knows it. Something's wrong. Jesus had every reason to scold his disciples, but he did not. Instead, he offers them the standard Hebrew greeting, peace be with you. Not once, but twice, peace be with you. Luke says that when Jesus came into that room, the disciples were terrified. <laughs> I mean, whoa, whoa. They thought he was a ghost. And in the Gospel of Luke, it says, Jesus told them, why are you terrified? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. I'm not a ghost. It's me. Dear ones, when Jesus is in our midst, peace comes. When we know he is with us and we accept that reality, peace comes. Even in the unanswered questions, even in our struggles, even in our pain. It doesn't mean that our lives are all together and pain-free. No, Jesus told us, in this world you will have trials. But it does mean that in struggle, even in struggle, God offers us a deep inner rest in our spirit. More important than even the answers to our prayers, and I want to say this over and over again, more important than even the answers to our prayers is the reality, the deep resolve that he is here. It is well with my soul. We want an answer to this. I've got to get this job. I need this person to, to approve of me. I need this. I need that. Lord God. And the Lord says, no, am I enough? This morning he reminds somebody here, right now, in the midst of waiting for something, do not worry. I'm still in charge. And I know what I am doing on your behalf. Peace be with you. Once the disciples realize that this is Jesus and he's alive, their shame turned to joy. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what I would do. I'm already excited. What would I do if he just showed up right here? The reality is he is here. 
John says they were overjoyed. Our light heart says a lot about our Savior. Look through the Gospels and we find Jesus frequently telling people, be of good cheer, cheer up, lighten up. To the paralytic lying there on that mat in the, or right there in the bed, he said, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. To the woman with a bleeding problem, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has healed you. Be of good cheer. Now, we may say we trust Jesus, but are we of good cheer? Does our joy convey this incredible trust? Tony Campolo, oh, does he write. Sometimes he just kills me. He wrote this, most Christians I know have just enough of the gospel to make them miserable, but not enough to make them joyful. They know enough to keep them from doing things the world tempts them to do, but they do not have enough of a commitment to God to do other things that they might experience the fullness of his joy. We have God, but only so much, only so much to avoid sin. But there's more to this. Jesus told us, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. That my joy may be in you, and it is complete. Jesus didn't just show up to give the apostles peace and even joy, but he came to commission them to take what he is giving them and to give it away. When he comes in, he says, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus described himself over and over again as the one who is sent by God. Now as he prepares to ascend to heaven, his final task is to commission his disciples to carry on what he had begun. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just as God breathed into the first human being, Adam, the Ruach of life, unlike any other cre creature, he breathed the Ruach, the spirit of life, into that first human being. So here is Jesus breathing the spirit of life, something new on his apostles, something new is happening here. Now we know that the spirit will come in his fullness on the apostles at Pentecost. Yes, that will happen. But something significant happened that resurrection night. I believe that the disciples received the first installment of the spirit of God. And in God's spirit, and only in God's spirit, they would eventually set out to change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine the excitement that night. Jesus is alive. His mission is still on. We're a part of it. He's alive. This is it. Here we go. Everybody had to be dancing for joy. Jesus, our Lord, is resurrected from the dead. He's eating with us. He's there. Everything is great. Everybody is excited. James, John, the rest, they're all ecstatic except for Thomas. And you know why? Thomas wasn't there. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples. And when he finally shows up, the other disciples tell him, We've seen the Lord. We can almost hear them. You know what the women had told us? It's true. He is alive. We know. We've seen him. We heard, we heard him. He was right here. He's eating with us. He's one of us. He's alive. Not only that, but he's commissioned us. This is it. We're on. And instead of getting all excited and saying, oh, at last, that's so cool, what great news. No, Thomas kind of lashes out 
And he says in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Unless I see, unless I see. And those three words will brand Thomas as the doubter through the ages. Unless I see. And in many ways, it's kind of unfair. Because if you look through the Bible, you'll find that many men and women of God, who some, they, they doubted as well, they had their moments. King David, Job, Solomon. Many had their share of doubts. Is this for real? Really? Even John the Baptist, we read in the Gospels, he had his moments. Here was the great forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ, calling, preparing people to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Repent, repent. The kingdom of God is near. But you'll remember that when John was imprisoned, he began to wonder if this Jesus was the real Messiah. I mean, if Jesus is the Messiah, then why am I here What's going on? He heard that Jesus was out there doing, doing uh, healing and doing all this stuff, but it didn't sound like the Messiah he, even he had expected. And then he asks, he asks in Matthew chapter 11, he sends two messengers to go to Jesus to ask, are you the one? Are, are you the one or should we expect someone else? Here's John, the Elijah of his day, saying, I don't know. I just don't know. Are you sure you're it? Do you ever have doubts about your faith? I mean, deep down inside, do you ever have those doubts? Do I, I really believe this? Do I believe you? We say, no, no, I'm, I'm a Christian. No, but deep down, am I living the confident, loving, holy life that God has called me to live? Totally con committed, I, I'm at, pa at peace. Do I have my doubts? Can I trust him? I remember when I was, uh, before I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I shared last week in Resurrection Sunday that I was a Roman Catholic. And in the middle of the Mass, there is a, a beautiful creed that before you receive communion, you always state that, that this is what I believe. And it's the Nicene Creed, and I believe in the Lord, God, the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. And you begin this wonderful creed at some point in the Mass, and at some point in my teen years and, and early adulthood, I stopped saying it because I couldn't say it. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I wasn't sure I believed. So every time people stood, I just kind of stood there, but I couldn't say it. Today, you, you may have some doubts about this. Some doubts about God. Why does he allow this, or why did this happen? And maybe you wonder sometimes where you even stand with God. I want you to know today, I truly believe that doubting is not sin. In fact, I believe that God respects our probing questions. Can I just say that? As we doubt, as we have our questions, and we really wonder, Lord God, I, I just don't understand this thing. God invites us to ask questions. He's big enough. He can take it. He wants us to seek real solutions. He wants us to come to him and to be honest with him. See, I believe there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Here's the difference. Doubt can prompt sincere questions. I don't understand. I don't know. 
Unbelief won't hear the answers. Doubt can prompt sincere questions. Unbelief won't hear the answers. Thomas, the disciple, wasn't an unbeliever. He was a disciple. He was a believer with questions. And he wasn't afraid to say so. He wasn't going to just buy in until he knew for himself. And what do we know about Thomas? Well, we know he's called Didymus. And in verse 24, we read, now Thomas called Didymus. Does anybody know, some of you who have studied the word, do you know what Didymus means? That's right. Thank you, Harold. That word means double. It's where we get the word ditto. Double. So we know that he is a twin. We also read in the word that there's something about Thomas. He's kind of pessimistic, <laughs> a little bit. His glass is usually half empty. You know what a pessimist is? I read this. A, a pessimist is someone who feels bad when he feels good because he's afraid he will feel worse when he feels better. <laughs> Any pessimists here? Do you know a pessimist? Are you living with one? Did you grow up with one? Remember when Jesus wanted to go back to Jerusalem to see his friend, Lazarus, who was about to die? He waited a while. The disciples didn't want him to go, but Jesus told them that the death of Lazarus would be used to build their faith. Thomas then spoke up and said, well then, let's all go. We might as well die with them. Do you hear a little pessimism there? A little sarcasm? Not long after that, during the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples he's about to go away, and he says, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And it's Thomas who pipes up, Lord, we don't know, and we don't know the way. What I like about Thomas is he was honest. He had that kind of probing personality I believe that resurrection night when Thomas met up with the disciples and they were all excited about seeing Jesus alive, Thomas honestly wanted to see for himself. And that night of the resurrection, it offers us some insights about doubt. The first thing that I want to see about this is that doubt usually arises in isolation. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the apostles. I, I sometimes wonder, well, where was he? Well, maybe he was an introvert trying to work this resurrection thing out. Maybe he was trying to deal with his sorrow alone. Maybe he, he just didn't get the word that Jesus was alive and he's just trying to work through this thing and he, he just kind of pulled himself away. Do you remember something important that happened and you weren't there? You missed it? This isn't a commercial, but it's one of the reasons we need to be here worshiping every Sunday. And I know there are times when we all need a break and we need to step away, and sometimes it's good to go away and worship wherever. At any moment, however, when we are together as the body of Christ, God can break through with a profound insight and can change us and can change our outlook forever. And it is really important that we as the body come together as often as possible. It's true there are times when we need a break, a personal rest, but we need to be careful that this doesn't become a habit. Satan does his best to isolate us especially when we're down. And it seems the longer and farther we're away, the more intense our struggle. Thomas may have been really struggling that Resurrection Sunday, and his struggles intensified when he realized he missed something very important. 
I wonder if he was mad at himself, and maybe he was jealous of the apostles. He just made it clear that he needed to see Jesus personally. And something else we learned from Thomas here is that doubt demands evidence. Thomas honestly wanted to see Jesus' hands and feet, and I believe God honored his search. In fact, God responds when we earnestly want to know him better, when we want to know the answers. I remember this. When I, on Resurrection Sunday, 1980, I'm there, some before you were born for some of you. I'm walking out of mass because I had an intense impression from the Holy Spirit to get up and walk. Mom rem remembers, I walked out of mass at the old mission. I sat down by um, a bench outside a creek, outside the old mission, and a man walks by and he says, do you know God loves you? And I didn't even notice his face. I didn't, I didn't notice a thing. I, I, just, I just said, you know, frankly, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going through so much at work. I've poured everything into my career. My fiance is gone. Life is so horrible right now. I don't know where God is. I didn't even know who I was talking to. It just opened the door. <laughs> and by the time I looked up, he was gone. And that very day, that very moment, I asked, I didn't know how to say this, I didn't know how to speak to God just openly like this, but in my heart I asked, I must know you. Help me to know you. That very week, I went back to KNBC. I was called as a reporter to begin interviewing Pastor Earl Lee, whose son was a hostage in Iran, one of the 52 Americans held hostage by the Ayatollah Khomeini, the Iranian hostage crisis, the story behind Argo the movie. I am called by NBC to interview this family, and for 10 months I interviewed this family, and their faith convinced me, you know what, there's something to this. And in God's perfect timing, I gave my heart to Jesus. I needed the evidence, and I saw it in a family that was going through a crisis, that they had this confidence that I knew I needed. A whole year later, I'm standing next to a guy. I'm becoming a Nazarene. I didn't even know who Nazarenes were. I decide, I think this is right, I think this is the Lord, and I decide to become a Nazarene. Larry Fuller, a guy who's joining the church with me, he turns to me and he goes, Janine, I don't even know why I'm asking you this. This is the craziest thing, but do you now know God loves you? Do you know God loves you? And if you're not sure and you doubt it, then go seek him. Seek me with all your heart and I will be found by you, the Lord says. Don't just sit with doubts. We just sit there. Well, maybe, maybe not. No, seek after the Lord. He is true. He is faithful. Something else. Oh, this is so beautiful. When Thomas truly sought God's help and he wanted to know, Jesus answered his prayer. He didn't wait too long. One week later, it says, he comes, and this time Thomas is there. I'm not going to miss this. He was there. Peace be with you, he says. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Here we see that doubt can actually draw us closer to Jesus. Thomas's honest inquiry brought about a personal encounter with our Lord. Everybody else was there, but Jesus really came to find Thomas. And Thomas received all the evidence he needed up close and personal. 
Now, did he actually put his hands in Christ's side? I, I don't know. It doesn't say. All we know is that Thomas's doubts were consumed by the reality of God's presence. And yes, Jesus died in Jerusalem, but he's back from the dead. He is alive, my Lord and my God. As I've walked with Jesus these 34 incredible years, I can honestly say that at this stage of my life, I don't doubt God's presence. He's been there in the greatest of pain and the unanswered questions. I sometimes doubt his methods. I doubt his timing. But I know that in all things, God works together for good. Some of those things baffle me. And so in the midst of this time, sometimes you may be going through a doubt. You wonder, is this ever going to change? You wonder if God's going to turn things around. You wonder that for that spouse that you've been praying for, that person you've been praying for, you wonder, God, is anything going to turn of this? And the thing that I think God is, is calling us to do today is, number one, admit my doubt. Let me just admit it to you, Lord. I am really struggling here. And next, I think we need to ask ourselves, why am I doubting? Is it my past? Is it the stuff that I've seen and heard has affected my trust in you? What's causing me to doubt now? And then, Lord, can you help me? I believe that the Lord calls us to pray. We need to turn our doubts into questions and turn our questions into prayer and turn our prayers to God. Do you trust the Lord who is there for Thomas? And then I think we need to acknowledge my own limitation here. There are things in my life that I may not always understand. I may not understand some things in life that he has done or he's allowing to happen. But because I know that I know deep in my heart that where I have been, he's been. And what I've gone through, he's helped. And when I don't always have the answers, I know the one who does. And there just comes a time that even in my doubts, whatever they are, Lord God, please use them to draw me close, not to run away from you, but to draw even closer than I've ever been to you. Help me, Jesus, to not just run from my doubt or ignore them, but to actually say, Father, use this. For even in my questions and even in the darkness, I know that I know you are my Lord, right. my God. I'm going to invite Phil to come and lead us. And there may be somebody here who's saying, you know what, I'm dealing with the unknown right now. There are some things that still linger in my life. And I just need to just, before I just head out into the world, I just want to just come and just lay them before the Lord. <laughs> I'm not even sure I've even voiced these doubts to you, Lord, but I need to offer it up and I need to say, help me. Help me not to run from doubt, but to use it, Lord God. Transform this into something for good. And I just need to come, and I need to bow before you before I go. So as we sing, I just invite you, as the Holy Spirit leads, to, to join me at the altar. Because sometimes the best way is to bow. Lord, I praise you this beautiful day. Thank you for appearing to Thomas. Thank you for appearing to to me and to so many of us showing yourself Lord God physically you've been there you've, you've touched our lives you've shown us the way 
I think if we were honest, totally honest with you, there are things in our, our own journey that prevent us, Lord, from being so totally on fire for you, of having that joy, of, of having that peace, Lord God, whatever it is, if there are even doubts in my own spirit, Help me to see what they are, Lord God, to lay them before your feet. Help us all, Lord God, to trust you with all our heart, to stop leaning on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you. And you, Lord God, do make our path straight. Whatever you did for Thomas, please do it for each one of us, Lord. Enable us to get to that place where we begin every day with the awe. Ah, my Lord, my God. You are alive. You're with me. And together we're going to take on this day. I want to live it completely for you. And I want you to receive the glory, Lord God, no matter what I go through. No matter what's going on, and I don't understand, in the name of Jesus, turn my doubt into an offering. Then I might offer everything I know of myself, and what I don't know, everything is yours. Breathe into me, Lord. Breathe into every one of us. The Spirit of God. Flood us, Lord God, with a confidence that says, no matter what, I am yours. We are yours. That thrusts us into your world where there are hurting, confused, lonely, hiding people. If I have not led anyone to you, Lord Jesus, in a while, burn within my spirit, Lord God, the desire to share the truth that without you, life is lost. Help us, Almighty God, to see that life begins with Jesus. And there is nothing on this world, nothing this world offers like you. The peace, the joy, the hope that we all need comes from heaven. So, Lord God, if I have any doubts, and there are things that are running through my mind, help me to stop living with them and begin to seek you with all my heart. For in your own way and time, you answer our prayers. You, God, fulfill your promises. We pray this in the powerful, amazing, matchless, awesome name of I am Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me? Now to him who is able to do abundantly more than we can ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. And would you find a brother or sister to say this morning, I'm so glad we're here today. Amen. Amen.